still my path is straight You are beside me You guide me for the sake of your name The King of Love My Shepherd is The thing I like If I hear Any affliction, a table is set. Perfume and oil, you, you anoint my head. You lead me by a stream, and I am in red. The king of love, my shepherd is the thing I like if I am here. The king of love will be with me all the day. When I walk through a valley I am not afraid When I'm lost in the shadow Still my path is straight You are beside me Guide me for the sake of your name The King of Love My Shepherd is The thing I like If I am here The King of Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. 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 Hi, I'm Lindsay Smallwood. I'm a partner here at the River, and I'm so glad to be speaking with you today. When my husband and I got married, I was a special ed teacher in the Oakland Public School, and he was a grad student at Berkeley. So we were not bringing in the big bucks. In fact, we lived in a tiny 400 square foot rental unit in West Berkeley, and it was so small that as newlyweds, we had no choice but to work it out after arguments because there was nowhere else to go. We had our first baby in that little rental and then our second and four people in 400 square feet is doable, but it was really close quarters. 
Then Chris graduated and got a job. It was a sweet fellowship uh, following his dream of doing physics research in Boulder, Colorado. And I was thrilled. Colorado seemed like a great place to live. And it was a real job for him. And moving out of the Bay meant that we could probably buy a house. And I, I'd almost go so far as to say that we had a deal, right? I'd move across the country to follow his dreams and his job, but I would get the cute house on a tree-lined street where I could stay home with my babies, maybe even in a cul-de-sac. And all that is fine until after we put down the deposit on the cute little house that we found, the perfect little fixer-upper with a basement that was just asking to be remodeled. Chris's new boss in Boulder announced that he was going to be moving the physics research lab to Michigan in just 18 months time. We were bummed and pretty unsure about what to do next. We decided to let the deal fall through on the house and suddenly we found ourselves thousands of miles from anything we knew with no place to call our own and a really uncertain professional future. The University Housing Office offered us a spot to live uh, in the dorms. Two bedrooms with bright orange doors and linoleum floors and concrete walls with neighbors and noise on every side. It was definitely not my cute little cul-de-sac dream. And I knew that I should be thankful that there was this nagging voice in my head, I mean the good nagging voice, that was reminding me that our new home on campus was more than enough to meet our needs and it was more than most people had the world over. But I had been telling myself a story. After living in dorms and apartments for almost 15 years, I wanted a house, a home. I wanted paint chips and flooring samples and the shiplap that I saw on HGTV. I wanted a space for a piano and room to entertain. And somewhere along the way, I'd convinced myself that I deserved those things. I think it's a spiritually dangerous place to live as if you're owed something. In today's passage from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks to that part of us. Now, I'm not accusing any of you of sharing my particular suburban cul-de-sac dreams. I imagine that if all of us who are listening today had the chance to talk about some of the deep longings in our own life, our preferred outcomes would be quite different. But all of us carry hungers. We all have desires for security, for comfort, for home, for some version of the good life, whatever that means to you. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus addresses those longings directly. And he points out how when our desires are wrongly ordered, our lives risk disappointment, dissatisfaction, and ultimately ruin. But Jesus also points us toward a new order, a new posture for that yearning place inside of us. And he calls us to a different way of living in the world. But before he does that, he talks about fasting. Matthew 6, 16 says this, Whenever you fast, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so their fasting is obvious to people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. When you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so your fasting isn't obvious to others, but to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. If you were here last week, Grace talked about Jesus' previous teachings on prayer. And one of his key instructions to his followers was not to do the right things, but for the wrong reasons. That's echoed again here with fasting. Depriving ourselves of food for a time can be a super meaningful way to set aside one thing in order to gain spiritual clarity. But the goal always has to be private connection with God, not public virtue signaling. It's then after this teaching on fasting that Jesus goes on to talk about the things that we treasure. Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moss and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, 
There your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. When I heard this passage taught when I was growing up in the church, store up treasure in heaven, my takeaway was usually something akin to delayed gratification. Something like, it's okay if you don't have treasure in this life, if you don't have a great house or beautiful jewelry or money for expensive vacations. Those are your treasures on earth. But if you follow God, you'll get treasure in heaven. And I imagine that to be quite literal, right? I may not have a McMansion here, but if I keep up with the Jesus thing, I'll get a blinged out estate in the afterlife. And uh, if I keep doing good deeds, I would get literal jewels on an actual crown that I would wear someday on my castle in the sky. But the longer that I study Jesus and the more that I listen to his words, this interpretation of treasure in heaven seems less likely to me. My grandmother, Grams, we called her, uh, lived a pretty unextraordinary life by most metrics. She was a cardiac nurse and a wife and a mother. She played in a canasta club. But Grams was lit from the inside. She loved life. She would sit in her backyard on her porch swing and look for bluebirds. She was regularly astonished by the beauty of the mountains or fresh fallen snow. She was also constantly surprised by the goodness that she encountered in other people. I can still hear her saying things to me like, oh, what a nice young man. Can you believe that he held the door for us? How kind of him. She, she was generous to a fault, always slipping me money, making sure she had my favorite things on hand. And when I needed a place to live after college, she opened her home to me. And I knew she was wonderful, she was my Grams, but it wasn't until she died that I realized that she wasn't just wonderful to me, her granddaughter, she was like that to everyone all the time. At her funeral, person after person kept coming up to tell me stories about how she'd helped them pay for college and how she'd taken them out for a meal on a hard day and how she'd opened her home to them when they needed it. She sent encouraging letters to people and remembered their birthdays and pointed out all the good things that she kept noticing to anybody who would listen. The sunshine in her life just shined on so many. Graham's treasure was in heaven. And it's not because she was waiting for some kind of heavenly reward. Graham treasured the things that Jesus treasures, the goodness and beauty in the world and in people. And Graham's loved what God loves the chance to extend herself generously to others. Living that way filled her life with light. When Jesus tells us to store up treasure in heaven, he is inviting us to a new kind of kingdom, a new way of living. The kingdom of heaven in the vocabulary of Jesus is a kingdom where truth abounds, where justice flows to everyone, where beauty is seen and Every need is met and met abundantly. It's a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy. And when Jesus says that we ought to store our treasure there in heaven, he's telling us that those heavenly ideals are the ones that we should hold dear. It's not hard for us to see that those ideals are not the ideals of this world. The world says, your body is your treasure. So prioritize your health and accentuate your beauty, live longer, look younger, use this product, wear these clothes. The kingdom of the world says that your home is your treasure and you need to live in a certain neighborhood and decorate in a particular style and build your wealth through real estate. The world says that money is your treasure. Start a 401k, keep a stock portfolio, invest wisely and always keep your eye on the numbers. And on and on it goes. There's a hundred ideals that the world would ask us to live up to. There's so many places 
where you can build your treasure in this life. But what Jesus is trying to get at here is that if we try it, and God knows we all try it, if we attempt to store up treasure in this life, to, to channel the energy and direction of our longings on anything except the kingdom of heaven, it'll ruin us. No one can serve two masters. If you make your body your treasure, you will become a slave to all the things your body needs in order to reach its peak. If you make money your treasure, you will serve it. And money is a terrible master. Your greed will never be satisfied. Even good things like relationships and family, if we set our heart on them as our ultimate treasure, they will rule over us and ultimately disappoint us. All of these treasures are passing away, eaten by the moth and rust of this life. But the kingdom of heaven endures. And if we set our heart on the things God loves, if we order our lives around the life of Jesus, we are promised that our master will be a good, good father to us. How? How do we do that? How do we become people who treasure heavenly things? Well, Jesus has the answer for that too. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. And yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do so much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, they'll be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. Don't worry. That's Jesus' word to us. And I think we all know that that's easier said than done. Why does Jesus tell us not to worry right after he warns us about the danger of staking our lives on the wrong things, on treasuring the wrong things? I think it's because when we try to store up our treasure here, it's often because we're worried. We shop and we save and we build our own little kingdoms because we're afraid of an unknown future yet to come. We want to control whatever we can of this life. And Jesus here tries to set us right by reminding us we are not in control. Our Heavenly Father holds everything in his hands, tending to the whole universe, even the birds, even the flowers. How much more will he care for you, his beloved child? I went kicking and screaming into those boulder dorms, but those orange doors and concrete walls were God's provision for us. I didn't get to choose the things I thought I would. And in life, many of us don't. But those days in the dorms with my babies were good gifts filled with surprises that I could have never imagined when life began to change for us. And that season shaped me and it reoriented me from a person with a deep longing for an HGTV vision of my future to someone who began asking, I wonder where God might take us next and living that kind of life. The kingdom of heaven is not in your scheming and striving it's not in your planning and your trying. The kingdom of heaven is here. It's today. It's now. It's in the truth that God is with us. It's in the promise that we're loved and cared for. 
It's the goodness and beauty and joy in the world. It's the chance to enact justice and offer mercy and live lives of generous love. I wanna close with three things. And the first is this, I'm gonna invite you to take some time and consider this passage this week. In preparation for this sermon, I've been reading this text every day for the last few weeks, but honestly, I struggled with what to say to you today. A lot of times when I'm preparing to give a message, there's some obvious complexity to untangle. Why does the Bible tell the story of the Hebrew midwives in Exodus? Or there's some fresh angle to bring to a complicated text. But as I read this passage, I just kept thinking, wow, good sermon, Jesus. I'm not sure I can add much to that. And so feeling a little stuck on Wednesday night, I asked if my small group could serve as my unofficial sermon planning brain trust. And we read this passage together and talked for an hour. And I wish I had time to share everything that came up for the people in our group, the way that worry spirals in our lives, the way we deal with anxiety and fear, the words of this passage and the ways that they've served as both a wound and a balm. One woman shared about a physics class she took at UC Davis. The professor, she said, was so smart and she couldn't quite follow it all, but she loved his lectures, although she only ever managed to score as high as a 40% on any exam. Yet somehow he curved the test in such a way that she managed to pass the class. And after she told us that anecdote, she said, you know, Jesus is a little bit like that professor. You read this sermon and he's so wise and you almost think you understand it, but then you try to live it and you realize that you're only at about 40%. There's just so much here. And I think Jesus does take our 40% and make it enough, but there's so much more to learn. So I encourage you to really spend time sitting with these words this week, read them, and listen to what Jesus might say to you in this text. As you read, the second thing I'd encourage you to do is to pray your worries. We're in the midst of our fall challenge at the river and we're focusing on prayer this year. I wonder what it would look like to become a people who find themselves significantly unburdened of their worry in prayer. I think that kind of community is possible. Tell God what you're longing for in this season of your life. What do you worry about? Tell him. To name your fears. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you about the things that you treasure. And then I want us to practice being present. I'd like to lead us in just a moment of what's called a breath prayer. The breath prayer is such a great way of entering into the moment with God. Breathing keeps us present. Paying attention to the breath in our lungs helps us stay anchored in right now, not the past and our failures there, or the future, which will have enough troubles of its own. So in a moment, we'll say a breath prayer from Matthew 6. I'm going to give instructions about what to do, then we'll pray the prayer through three times. When we're finished, we'll sit in silence for a moment, allowing ourselves the chance to notice what we experienced in prayer. And then I'll have some questions on the screen, and I invite you to Take time to think about those and discuss them with someone else if you're able. Let's begin by putting your feet squarely on the floor and sitting up in your chair, allowing your spine to straighten as you're able. Breathe in slowly, holding your breath for a moment and then breathe out. Breathe again exhaling slowly. This time, on the inhale, we'll say, look at the birds, and then on the exhale, do not worry. Look at the birds, they do not worry. Now, look at the flowers, you love me more. Look at the birds, they do not worry. Look at the flowers, 
you love me more. Look at the birds. They do not worry. Look at the flowers. You love me more. Amen. God is our refuge, our strength and our shield, an ever-present help. We will not fear, though the earth gives way, and the mountains crash into the sea. There is a river whose streams will make glad the city of our most high king and God is within her and she will not fail he helps her at break of the day the nations in uproar Men's kingdoms they fall He speaks and the earth melts away Of course we imagine The strongest of storms The fortress it will still remain There is a river Whose streams will make glad city of our most high king and God is within her and she will not fail listen and hear the Lord say be still and know that I And know that I am God. Come, let us see what the Lord has done. The ruin He brings to the earth. He makes 
pours the seas to the ends of the earth. He shatters the bow and the spear. And there is a river whose streams will make glad the city of our most high king. God is within her and she will not fail. Listen and hear the Lord say, Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Fear not, I will pilot 